Hello, I'm Linda Yu, and welcome to this Intelligence Squared Plus event, Building a Global Brand with former Nike CMO Greg Hoffman. We're recording on Thursday, April 21st from studio in London, and I'm very excited to introduce my guest. Greg Hoffman is the former chief marketing officer at Nike and the founder of brand advisory group Modern Arena. During his nearly three decades at Nike, Hoffman led three Olympic campaigns and has worked with everyone from LeBron James to Serena Williams. Of course, Nike swoosh and just do it make it one of the most recognizable global brands. He's also the author of the new book, Emotion by Design, Creative Leadership Lessons from a Life at Nike, which will be the topic of our discussion today. And just a reminder to our viewers and our listeners, please tweet your thoughts and engage with others using the hashtag IQ2. Firstly, welcome, Greg. Absolutely delighted to have you here with me today to tell me um, about your book. But before we get to your book, tell me first, what drew you to design and how did you end up at Nike? In your book, you write that you weren't initially interested in a Nike internship since you thought that, quote, design was more than some commercial selling shoes. Mm, yes. Well, uh, I don't think that today, of course. But um, yeah, I, I really had two passions growing up uh, r right out of the gates, uh, sport and art. And um, I, although I didn't necessarily know from the beginning that you could make a living through art, meaning drawing and painting and sculpting, um, my parents really invested in that passion, right, every day. And um, lo and behold, as I grew older and uh, go went further and further into these two passions, um, I was lucky enough to integrate those and not have to make a choice which path I wanted to go on and ultimately was able to pursue that passion through an internship at Nike, where I did indeed learn that Nike is far more than just not only a commercial, but a product. Um, Nike in some ways is a state of mind. You know, you mentioned just do it. And it's very rare that a brand can transcend its own products and become a state of mind or an approach to how you can live a life to your full potential. And so that uh, was the, the that kickstarted my career, that, that internship. And um, I'm uh, very grateful to have spent um, that time at such an influential, iconic brand. Mm. So tell me why you wrote this book. Yes, well, to twofold. Um, I've always obviously had an obsession with creativity and not just creativity in the artistic sense, but how it can be harnessed and uh, applied within the business context. And over the years, I started to develop a methodology and approach of using creativity and the practice of creativity through the disciplines of advertising, of design, um, of uh, webs, it could be designing websites and apps um, or retail spaces and events. Ultimately, the practice of this and the commitment to these creative disciplines within business is ultimately what leads to the emotional bonds between your audience and your brand. And so uh, I wanted to basically bring that to the world. Again, um, uh, uh, you know, a thoughtful approach um, and practical tips that can help any leader, whether you're a leader of one or a leader of many, how can you cultivate a creative culture in your workplace or in yourself um, to achieve stronger emotional attachments between your products and the people you serve? You start the book with a great Nelson Mandela quote, um, as they all are. <laughs> so Mandela said, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. So tell me about how you see the connection between sport and marketing, specifically what marketing can learn from sport and what marketing adds to the love of sport. Absolutely. Well, I think, uh, you know, if you look at Nike's uh, slogan before Just Do It was there is no finish line. 
right? That pursuit of excellence is something that you go after for a lifetime. And certainly within sports, you know, athletes of all types, whether it's you or I or the elite athletes you see on TV, are always trying to exceed um, their, their best, right? And I think most athletes um, aren't satisfied um, with what they did yesterday. And they're, they're pursuing kind of this aspiration and vision of what's possible for tomorrow. And I think marketing and design is in that same kind of, has that same mindset in terms of the individuals who practice within those industries, that you're always looking for ways to engage consumers with stories that will resonate in a deeper way. That there's always an opportunity for designers to improve their craft to create a product that better serves their audience, to tell uh, a story through new mediums um, that are, are tap into the kind of uh, emotions of, of you know, their audiences and people. And more importantly, just as sport um, has the power to stir our emotions and make us think about, well, maybe we need to redefine our goals and what we think is attainable. I think that's the role of marketing as well. It's not just about, and this is a good tip for anybody in business, right? Um, branding isn't just about figuring out how you want your audience to feel about you, okay? Certainly that's part of branding. But I think what separates great brands from good brands is those that spend just as much time thinking about how you want the consumer to feel about themselves and their ability to achieve great things in their life. And those are brands that are empowerment brands. And those are the brands that transcend, transcend just transactional relationships, right? It becomes a personal relationship. So on that theme, um, it's a good point to ask you about the title of your book, Emotion by Design. So just tell me more about how that's different from the way that marketing is, say, typically done. Yeah, well, it means being intentional. By design means being intentional about the questions you ask during the marketing process, about the filters that you use, and making sure you're, you're focused on how you want, again, the consumer to feel uh, about your brand, but also themselves and their ability to achieve their goals. Because the more emotion you can create, the more confidence you can instill with your audience, um, the more you can empower them, the more they can in turn collectively change the world. And a lot of what I talk about is when a brand reaches a, a level of, of influence in culture and plays a, a, a bigger role in people's lives, you can uh, use your platform to make change in the world because you, you've, you've created that opportunity um, and, and meaning in people's lives. So um, it's, it's really, um, you know, focusing on going beyond just the rational aspects of brand building, right? And equally focusing on the emotional um, approach to, to consumer engagement. It's so interesting. So you stress empathy and curiosity as the reasons why Nike is a brand leader. So firstly, let's talk about empathy. So you write that's about forging a bond between your brand and your customer. And you tell the story of the campaign for that you did for the Brazil national football team. And you quote footballing legend Pele, who said, we want to dance. We want to ginga. Football is not about fighting to the death. You have to play beautifully. So tell me about all of that and how you were uh, responsible for uh, the preeminent, uh, preeminent, I should say, footballer Ronaldo from nearly being swarmed by fans. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, my my. Well, I've had this long relationship with the Brazil national team, and it's been a privilege, right? Uh, the minute I came into the company, I started working on the sport of football, which was great. And we just so happened to have this relationship with the Brazilian national team. And I did fly down to Brazil with a film crew and um, had the opportunity to do uh, a film and photo shoot during a scrimmage 
um, with the Brazilian national team. The only problem was is that the security was pretty laxed and it was free to the public to watch. And so the entire stadium had filled with people. And slowly but surely people started, the fans just have so much passion for the team. And they started coming up and over the, the moat and the wall and onto the field. And so at first I was trying to protect the team and Ronaldo um, with, with my team and holding everybody back. But as I could see, Ronaldo was trying to communicate with me that, no, let the people through. He wanted that connection. He wanted to give them access to what they loved. And that's when I really, it really became clear that Brazil, um, the Brazilian national team and the way they play was for the people. And that there was this incredible bond that I needed to make sure that I brought to the rest of the world through marketing and communication. And so every time we told the story of these amazing players, we also showcased the fans and the people of Brazil because it was an integral part of what made that team successful. And so furthermore, um, and this is, I think, a good tip for, for businesses of, of all sizes when it comes to this idea of diversity and the power of diversity um, within your team. And Brazil um, had so many amazing individual players, right, um, that all had their own life experience and journey to get to that point. And yes, there was structure to the way they played, but also it allowed that structure and playbook allowed each player um, the opportunity for spontaneity and improv. They were able to exercise their creative eccentricities. And um, what it made is just amazing moments that you had never seen before during a game. And so, well, wh why do I use that as an example when I talk about the power of a, di a diverse team within a business sense? is it just can't be about the numbers, right? Where you achieve diverse representation. You have to allow the individuals within that team to bring their personal perspective and life experience into the workplace and activate that. And what it, what it can lead to, just like on the football pitch, is amazing innovation um, and amazing stories that are more relatable, that um, attract and engage audiences and, and customers that quite frankly may have had barriers or access to the inspiration and innovation that you can bring to the world as a brand. So I think it's, it's, it's just a, it's very symbolic of how diversity really is the oxygen that breathes life into the innovation and creative process. And it just so happens with Brazil, it leads to these amazing goals. And by the way, just like this diversity leading to innovation and business success, Brazil is the only five-time World Cup champion. So that is one of the reasons why I just wanted to highlight uh, that uh, relationship that I had. And um, I'm glad you brought up Paley's quote, because when I was uh, a kid in the, the I don't want to date myself, but, you know, growing up as a grade school kid in the late 70s, you know, I idolized Pele, you know even in the U.S. where soccer wasn't as big, right, as it is in, in the U.K. here. That was just such a fascinating story you tell in your book about Ginga, this diversity, this spontaneity within the Brazilian national team, and making really football the beautiful game, which is, you know, the kind of thing that you that you bring across. But um, I was just relieved to hear that Ronaldo was OK. You were not responsible. for Dead, Well, there you go. And I, I was, too, because I probably wouldn't have made the trip back. So <laughs> here I am today. And in fact, in that campaign, you pushed to shoot the passion of the fans because that was the empathy, that was the connection that you were seeking. And it wasn't obvious, was it, um, at the start of the campaign, that that no, would be I, the way you would go or, or be the direction that they wanted you to go? Yeah, well, what, as I say, certainly when you're part of the creative process, uh, when it comes to creative problem solving, is empathy is the most important trait at the beginning of that process, because your job is to get beyond the observations and assumptions, the things we all see, to uncover the things we can't see, to be able to reveal a truth or an insight that is somewhat hidden 
once you kind of can see that and articulate that, then you can move to revealing that in an amazing story or an amazing product or experience. But it really starts in the beginning. And what was revealed that although we had all of our focus on these athletes during the games with these amazing things that um, obviously they were, they were doing, that people took so much joy from, but the more time we spent with them, digging a bit deeper, sitting with the team, asking questions, we moved beyond just that and started, it started to reveal this relationship that they had with the people um, of Brazil. And it was really important for us to reveal that to the world, right? And um, just like Jenga is, you know, it has so many influences that come from the culture and the people, Samba, Capoeira, you know, Brazilian martial arts. And so it's, it's just an intersection of so much culture from, from the, the region. And so um, oftentimes no one beyond the photography of the games for decades um, was able to access that inspiration. So it was a joy to, to reveal that uh, to the world. So the second reason um, that you wrote about as to why Nike is a brand leader is curiosity, which you describe as the catalyst for creativity. So you say curiosity is a muscle and it needs to be trained and not to be left to chance. So tell me about how organizations can do that and what you learned from a guy known as the Bigfoot Hunter. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, here... Yeah, this is really important because I do believe that um, curiosity is the the lifeblood, if you will, of the creative process. And it's really important. You know, one thing is that I've always said complacency is the enemy of curiosity. And it's really important to get outside of yourself and find points of inspiration that exist in the world of technology, of entertainment of art, of architecture, you name it, just spending time in the cities and being able to bring that inspiration back into your organization. So much innovation comes from transference, things that are happening in other sectors that oftentimes are brought into a different sector to produce something that's never been seen before. I use the example of Nike Air, right? Nike Air is one of the greatest innovations in footwear design, right, in terms of cushioning. And Nike Air actually came from space exploration. NASA, a NASA engineer, was developing astronaut helmets. And he happened to approach Nike with those ideas, which ultimately led to the airbags within sneakers, right? So that's just an example of making sure that you're looking outside of your business sector. Not to mention that you're receptive to people bringing inspiration back in to your organization. And how do you do that? Well, um, we're not all naturally curious, right? And as I said, but I do believe that curiosity is like a muscle and you can't wait for it to just hit you by chance. And it's really important to make a plan. In some ways, give yourself homework. Who are you gonna meet? What can you see? Um, what can you experience? And then not only that, have a reservoir or a place you can bring the, the inspiration back. There are so many different platforms and technologies for sharing that inspiration. Because here's the thing, 90% of what you see or experience and bring back, back into the team may not ever lead to anything, but all it takes is one hit to create a whole new uh, experience and business uh, and revenue stream. And finally, you mentioned the Bigfoot Hunter. Really, um, as just a young 23-year-old, um, I really didn't have a concept of, you know, building your curiosity muscles, if you will. And so I went to my first design offsite for Nike way back when, and to show up, and the first speaker that they brought in was, lo and behold, a Bigfoot hunter, someone who hunted Sasquatch, okay? And at the time, I really couldn't understand. I was like, well, what, what does this have to do with shoes and Nike and sports? And, um, but it didn't take long to understand as I experienced the rest of the three days and started to see things from different walks of life and different voices and um, you know, illuminating 
different emerging trends in the world that, well, this is the whole point, that we have to be open uh, to inspiration versus just looking at what's before us all the time and only focusing on, you know, what's the task at hand. You have to carve out the space and time and manager, business managers especially have to show their teams that they value the time it takes to go and explore, right? And to go on those journeys to find what exists out in the world that you can pull back into your own arena. And so, yes, looking back at the Bigfoot hunter, and I'm not sure he ever found the Bigfoot he was looking for, um, but I can tell you I now have a better appreciation um, for what he and many other eccentric, uh, uh, you know, voyagers um, were, were doing at the time. And um, it doesn't always have to make sense, right? Um, if everything has to be rational and logical, um, especially if you want to be a brand that's a leading innovator, it's going to be really hard to do that. So always remember that branding and brand building is a rational and an emotional pursuit. But oftentimes, especially right now, as the, the process of engaging with your audiences has been quite automated, right? With machine learning, using data and analytics uh, to learn more about your consumers and hopefully serve them better. So there's a lot of great things about that and things that we have yet to untap on the science of branding and marketing. With that said, the art's being squeezed out a little bit. So it's important for business managers to ask the question, does art, the art of branding, still have a seat at the table at all levels? And um, be able to answer that question. Um, and that's another reason why I wrote Emotion by Design. It's really a call to arms as well, to remind ourselves of the power of creativity and a creative practice um, to move people like never before and be able to tell stories and create products that will never be forgotten. Yeah, I thought it was fascinating how um, every time a member of your team went on holiday, went on vacation, they would come back and you would do a, a bit of a download. What was the experience? Just to see if you could glean something out of the ordinary. I thought that was a great way of, of exemplifying what you're describing in business. Yeah, great, great point. I called those outside in uh, discussions and um, we would do them once a quarter. And it was a way of uh, also, again, um, getting into the habit and the practice of if you were traveling, just that, like I am here today uh, in London, making sure that I'm not only observing and soaking up these experiences, but I'm going back to share them with the people that I work with as well. So I can back to this idea of, you know, um, pull together to rise higher. You got to lift the whole team and you're gonna make everybody else stronger. So I highly suggest this idea of outside in sessions. I was just at the TED conference uh, in Vancouver. TED had taken a two year hiatus during the pandemic. It's not only my job to be there and um, look at all the emerging trends and technology in, you know, um, in the TED universe, if you will, and all these incredible speakers, but I also have to kind of edit through that and figure out what do I want to share with the teams and the brands that I work with um, so I can empower them as well. So a lot of it is just creating these, these habits um, that aren't meant to distract from you know the pace of driving your business. They're going to enhance and accelerate it. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating because I think sometimes people think maybe inspiration just strikes you and it's very striking in your book how you describe this process, creativity, curiosity, as something that you have to practice and just get into, uh, you know, into um, the marketing process. And I think that's... Well, I, if I can give you one example that I think will help your listeners um, who obviously are oftentimes under a lot of pressure to meet the, the business goals and demands and um, the growth that's, um, you know, being, being uh, you know, you're setting the goal to achieve this growth, right? And so another example is not that long ago, I took the team to Savile Row to look at um, a lot of the suit makers um, that have been doing this for sometimes decades, right? And just the incredible uh, commitment to craft 
and the ceremony of serving um, each individual in a personal way. And we walked out of that, that, um, that experience and we asked ourselves, well, what would that look like for sneakers? And literally w within less than six months, we did the first sneaker customization shop, really inspired by the suit makers of Savile Row. And in less than two years, you had a hundred of these shops in our flagship stores around the world. So my point is, is that you have to make a plan and allow that to happen. And that's where a lot of innovation comes from. And oftentimes it's not briefed, it's not on the current plan. Um, you have to go out and find it. Wait, so hang on. I remember you wrote in the book, you did not buy a suit when you visited Savile Row. So are you going to fix that this time you're in London? Well, <laughs> wow, I think things have gotten so casual. Um, and I still have a deep respect, obviously, for, for these amazing craftspeople. It's just amazing. But um, now you've got me, you've put me on the spot. So um, there's still time. Yeah. Oh, it's a bit of a, a retail therapy. You, pick, you could pick up yeah. new lessons as well. <laughs> so just um, a reminder uh, to our listeners and our viewers to please uh, tweet your thoughts and engage with others using the hashtag IQ2. So, Greg, now let's discuss the three elements that you've learned that produces the best creative results and work culture. So, one, embrace the daydreamers. Two, diversity is oxygen. And three, let the quiet voices speak the loudest. I was struck by the statistic that you gave, which is that introverts make up a third to a half of the population. And it includes people like Steven Spielberg, Larry Page, and even Albert Einstein. Tell me about these elements. Yes. Well, oftentimes, if you think of the traditional business structure, right, and organizations and cultures, uh, oftentimes these three groups um, don't feel uh, that they're part of the club, if you will, and that oftentimes there might be barriers to entry within a traditional business working environment. So when you think of when I talk about daydreamers, you know, right brain thinkers, uh, often the creative types who maybe don't think of things in such a, a linear way. And oftentimes daydreamers and creative types um, don't like the status quo. So much of innovation and the artistic pursuit is trying to push new boundaries and defy convention, right? And that's not always accepted within a business environment. So that's, that's one. The second is the quiet voices. I think we reward those with the answers in the moment, right? And just being the loudest voice doesn't mean you're right. And oftentimes, um, introverts are thinking about the future. They want to process what they're hearing. And if you give them the time to go back and think about that and come back and present their audacious vision, as you, as you saw with those individuals you listed, it can lead to amazing results. And finally, diverse voices. And now more than ever, we need to ensure that there's diverse representation in the workplace. And why is that? Well, certainly in the realm of creativity and marketing, when you're trying to creatively problem solve for human beings, for cities, for communities, you need to reflect what you see in the world within your workplace. And so um, a lot of the work I do today is to champion these three, three groups because I see myself in them. And over the years, um, I was lucky to be part of, of a company and a creative culture where I was not only invited, um, but, but um, you know, encouraged to lean in to those characteristics and traits. And so back to this idea of, of being a, a, an innovation brand, I think you need to embrace the daydreamers and the quiet ones and the diverse voices more than ever before if you want to be on the leading edge of, of you know, innovation as a brand and play a deeper role, not only in the lives of your, your consumers and your audience, but play a broader role in society and you know getting to that point 
where it becomes a natural extension of the brand to potentially address some of the most pressing issues of our time and doing that in an authentic way because you've earned that opportunity. So interesting. Um, so now tell me about Never Play It Safe, Play to Win, which is the title of one of your chapters. As companies become successful and you write, they find it's, well, too risky to take risks anymore. Um, how can you counteract that? That's that's great. And, you know, I've I've always had uh, a issue with teams in sports that play not to lose. You've seen it before. They're ahead. There's two minutes le left in the game. So they start playing defensive. They play not to lose. And guess what? They end up losing the game. So um, never playing it safe, playing to win in a business, um, in a kind of the business environment is where you incentivize risk taking, right? Where you create the space to dream about what's next and that you view success, um, you view you failure as the journey and the price of innovation, right? Failure leads to success. And I'd love to tell you, give you an example. It's not in the book, but it really is one of my favorite uh, Nike ads of all time, which is the Michael Jordan failure commercial, right? And um, what's interesting about this, this, uh, this ad is that the team at Widening Kennedy, Nike's ad agency partner, spent time with Michael Jordan and learned that he missed 9,000 shots over his career, that 26 times he had been asked to take the game-winning shot, and he missed. And again, this is the greatest basketball player in the world. And at the end of this ad, after talking about this, these failures, he says, you know, I failed again and again, but that is why I succeed. And guess what? While we can't relate to his exploits on the court, we can all relate to that idea of success coming from failure. And I think that's something that brands um, within certain teams and certain dimensions of their offense have to embrace that. That um, you're not, when you really think about it, uh, that one out of four ideas that make, that's a successful model, right? Not everything you create has to have a uh, 100% chance of making it out into the world. Um, that, as we talked about, perfection is not possible. So incentivize risk. Um, I really have an affinity for teams and athletes that put themselves in those positions, that ask for the ball, even especially in the moments that matter most, when the pressure's on the line. I think that separates um, the best from the good or the average. And I think that's the same with brands. The brands that have uh, dimensions within their team offense where you can dare to, to lead um, the pack and take those risks. And even if you fail, um, there's, there's a, an acceptance of that as the price to succeed and deliver that what's next, whether that be a product or a new experience um, out into the world. That actually reminds me of a story um, of um, Alex Ferguson, the pretty legendary manager of Manchester United. Um, when uh, Manchester United was losing in the last bit of the game, he actually pushes them hard to score a goal. Um, and the way he tells the story is the reason he does that is just as you, exactly the process you describe, but also the fans leave saying, oh, did you see that last minute goal, even though they lost? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, and I, I love that um, example. And I talk about in another chapter in the book, um, obsess the last 10% of the process. And that applies to sports as well. It's, it's another way of saying finish strong. And I think the best brands are great finishers, right? And too often, people, brands, athletes, take the last 10% 10, 10 of the game off, you know, when it seems like it's in hand. And I think your audience and your consumer appreciates the strong finish, but they can also spot when, you know, someone said, it's good enough. And the result, you know, shows up in the world. You know it when you see it, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Um, so it was also fascinating that you write. Um, it's not um, a large budget that's crucial. So tell me about your ten thousand dollar budget. So that's only about um, six, seven thousand pounds to market the nineteen ninety four World Cup in America and the Great Stinky Tour. That yeah. Resulted. Well, here's the deal. I'm you know at the time I'm you know twenty three years old. So um, I actually thought when I got the the, the budget, I thought, well, this is amazing because I didn't. What did I know, right? But then you started to kind of look at the opportunity where all these cities in the U.S. were all over America, and it's like, well, wow, how is how is this going to work? And a, a good friend of mine who um, I had already been working with, um, dreaming up different concepts. Um, when we first sat down, he said, well, we, we I have an idea. We could potentially use this old um, van that was being used to, you know, move trash. And I said, okay. And so basically what we did is this this van became kind of this this moving event retail vehicle to showcase the best of Nike football at the time, right? We didn't have much. You know, there weren't many athletes that we sponsor we didn't have a lot of product but we had a lot of passion right and we knew that getting that van on the road and being able to shake hands with all those fans that also shared the same passion could be quite powerful and of course we had to make sure stinky the van you know really just you know didn't actually stink right so um yeah i mean it was a it, it's a it's it's very symbolic of this idea that first and foremost before you think about how much money or budget you do or don't have the biggest question is do you have the passion for what you're doing for the subject matter right and how are you going to make sure that the consumer can feel that and share that passion with you right and um I love this. I love uh, stories of resourcefulness and resilience. And, and certainly for me, I always looked back at that one uh, in a way where we, we, never at, we never talked about what we didn't have, right? It was more about how do we reach all these people? And thankfully, to be honest, that was a really, really hot summer. We drew straws in terms of who was going to have to drive that van. And I ended up winning. So my friend was the one that took it on the road uh, on that. And um, yeah, it even had a swoosh, a chrome swoosh hood ornament on that. So just just to show you back to that obsessed the last 10 percent, um, we 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 didn't let anything go um, without uh, really, really detailing every aspect of that experience. That must have been fun. Um, you are giving away a free pair of Nike basketball shoes if you were beaten at a local park. So how many pairs of shoes did you end up giving away that summer? Yeah, <laughs> now you say that, my memory kind of has deserted me. Uh, <laughs> I want to... I You're off the hook. <laughs> right, I want to I sit with this idea that I won every game, okay? so You wrote yeah. a great book, so I'll that, let you there have you that go. one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you write that Nike's brand identity is, quote, to inspire others to achieve greatness. Nike Swoosh is one of the most recognizable brands in the world. But before 1994, it had Nike on top of the swoosh. You quote your colleague who said, oh, great. I'm going to be the creative director who creators a great brand. No other Fortune 500 company had made their brand identity just a symbol. So tell me the story of the famous swoosh. Yeah, well, up until that time, um, the swoosh logo was what you saw on shoes, right? And shirts, but um, and apparel. But uh, from a communication standpoint and uh, branding standpoint, the logo was the swoosh with the Nike Futura typeface on top of it, right? And so that was the actual logo. And then uh, the team saw Andre Agassi at Wimbledon playing in an all-white uh, uniform. And on his hat, yes, this white hat was just a black swoosh. It just looked so iconic. And so my boss at the time saw that swoosh and said, 
wow, I got an idea. And the good news is a lot of other people within the brand saw that too. And so he quickly put together a point of view on, well, what would happen if we moved from the Nike Futura logo to just the swoosh? And that's pretty daring if you think about that. And if you think of Nike's footprint in the world at the time. And so, um, but back to what I said about this, don't play it safe, right? Play to win, always push the edges. Um, he went and presented this, this kind of new vision of, of branding. And thankfully, everyone else dared to dream uh, as well, which happens so often, certainly in my career. And um, certainly within a year, shifted all of Nike's branding to swoosh only. And I think now we look back and we think, well, wasn't it always like that? But the reality is it took a bold, big move in a conversation between a small group, right? Um, no focus groups, just a group getting together, talking about what we believe, where we want to take the consumer. Will this improve their perception of both Nike and their ability to achieve what they want? Again, I'll keep going back to that. And um, so... Yeah, I mean, it's just an, an incredible uh, moment and story. And it also talks about um, the importance of building a brand identity and doing that, um, you know, with great commitment and that it's everybody's job within a company. Um, not long after that, I created a swoosh Bible, okay, a little silver book that talked about how important the swoosh was and how we should protect it and make sure that um, it's always applied with respect. And guess what? That little book didn't just go to the people in marketing or the people in design. It went to every single employee in the company. And so I relay that um, to your listeners so that they understand that it's not someone else's job, right? That it's, a, it's the collective support and mindset of every employee in a company to understand how important a brand's branding elements are. Whether it's the Tiffany blue, whether it's the white space that Apple uses, whether it's the Nike swoosh, whatever it is, why those companies have owned those brand elements is because their entire company culture understands its importance. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder uh, to our listeners to please uh, tweet your thoughts and engage using the hashtag IQ2. So, Greg, it was fascinating reading about mood boards and other ways to capture an athlete. So you write that it was clear that for Cristiano Ronaldo, he was a diamond. It meant his visual persona needed to be simple, polished, refined, which translated, and I found this absolutely fascinating, into diamond space travel and a supercar <laughs> in terms of his image. So just tell me about this process. Well, oftentimes we're delivering these amazing new inspirations into, or these amazing new innovations into the world that are inspired by and there to support these athletes with this incredible athleticism. So what we would do is you have these, you know, in some, some ways, some of these football boots that we were going to launch into the world were like supercars. And we wanted to make sure that these boots also represented the persona and the, the attitude and the style of play of the athlete themselves. And so a lot of what we would do to launch these products is create a world, like world building, and take the consumer into that world of elite speed, the, incredible explosive speed of someone like Cristiano Ronaldo. And so we would spend a lot of time trying to make sure that we understood the mosaic of an athlete's personality and what are the characteristics and what are the metaphors that we could kind of bring to life to communicate who the athlete was as well as their style of play. And that's where you get into these uh, amazing metaphors that really churned a lot of these products into living, breathing entities, right? And I think that's important, that it gets back to that idea of emotion by design, is that you're instilling, you're infusing and surrounding everything you do with emotion, 
with personality and the consumer can feel it. They're drawn to it. And in turn, when they put that football boot on, they too feel that they can accomplish amazing things, right? Um, it's not, again, I'll keep going back to this. Make sure within your business culture that people understand that it's a balance of the rational and the emotional and committing to the functions and the disciplines within your teams that are responsible for the the creative expression of your brand and the way your brand story is told externally um, you want to embrace them right because more often than not they're responsible for the way the consumer feels about you mm. Were, th were there any athletes who didn't like their visual persona <laughs> that you came up with? That's not me. <laughs> no, well, I, I think it's, I think that's the power. You raise a great point about the power of collaboration. And I'll just speak for myself, not, not, not necessarily about um, athlete collaborations, but I have this other principle, listen before you lead. And I think my weakest work or my weakest experiences as a leader is when I didn't do a lot of listening. And I came into the room, if you will, figuratively, um, with a preconceived notion of what I wanted to do and what I think an athlete is or what I think a consumer is before I've actually sat with them, talked with them, back to that idea of revealing these deep insights, right? So listen before you lead is really important so that you don't find yourself in a situation where you're looking across from an athlete or a community and they're saying, well, wait a minute, this isn't us at all. And um, you can avoid that is my point, you know? So, so um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And um, one, you know, thankfully, um, you know, we, we had a lot of folks around you and there's just so much emphasis on learning as much as you can about the subject matter, right? At the beginning of these processes. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to have time to go through all of the great chapters um, that you have in the book. They include starting a movement, the use of music, short form videos, um, you know, uh, absolutely fascinating. <laughs> um, but I do want to talk about your work on equality and um, color, um, Kaepernick. You write that your younger self would have seen, quote, the star quarterback who took that knee and realized that he did that for others like me. Tell me about your work with him and what it meant for Nike to be working with a player who wasn't playing. Yeah, no, it's a it's a it's a great question. And I'm glad you're 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 bringing that up. And, you know, it, it gets back to this idea of of. Diversity is the oxygen that breathes life in the creative process. And why do I say that? Because as chief marketing officer in 2017, when in the end of July and we're sitting down with Colin and I'm sitting next to him at lunch um, and he doesn't have a team to play for, but he's obviously in incredible shape, right? And he's, you know, it's such an incredible sacrifice that he made um, in the name of kneeling uh, to protest racial injustice and police brutality. And so as I sit there, the eyes that I look for as someone who grew up mixed race, half black and half white, like Colin, and like Colin, I'm also adopted, you know, by my loving white parents and grew up uh, and went to school in an all white school system. So that's the lens I'm looking through and I'm empowered in the room to do that, right? So I have the empathy uh, for Colin and this idea of not being able to separate your personal life and perspective and what you've experienced and what you see in the world and your professional life. And so it was natural for us in the room um, to, to lean into that and figure out a way to, um, you know, bring that uh, cause um, to the world, right? Through the way that we do, through storytelling, um, and really find a way to um, bring, uh, uh, you know, power to his voice and bring that out to the world. And so that led to obviously the Crazy Dreams campaign. 
And um, I, I think it's it exemplifies like the quality campaign before that, which was all about asking the question, you know, why does the ball not bounce the same for everyone? Why is it in that case in 2017, athletes saying, well, wait a minute, when we look at society, why is it that we're equals within the white lines of sport? But when we step out of it, the rules change. So um, for me anyways, just in terms of, of the experiences I had growing up and um, my affinity for athletes that did stand for something beyond sport and use their platform to exercise that and use their voice to inspire people and really break down barriers um, and give voice for those that didn't have that platform. So when I found myself in situations within the world of business, um, I, I, um, I had the confidence uh, to lean into that. And I think for, for businesses that are asking the question, um, well, how do I know if it's the right moment? Um, how do I make sure it's not a distraction or it doesn't take away from um, our, our business goals? And it's really important, first and foremost, that you're really clear and you've clearly articulated your brand house, right? What your belief is, why do you exist in the world? What's your mission and vision? Where are you going and how are you gonna get there? And what are your values? You have to be crystal clear on that. And the great companies have that on one sheet of paper and every employee in the company knows exactly what that is. And once you've clearly articulated that, then you look for ways to say, how does what we sell um, connect to what the world needs in a moment of t in time on a particular issue? And obviously, if there isn't a strong connection there, it's probably not the right moment for you to speak on that particular cause. If it is very clear in terms of that connection, then I would guess, and oftentimes it is the case that your shareholders, your employees, and your consumers are expecting you to lean into that and use your platform to try to push the world forward in a much more positive way. Thank you very much. So much more um, we could discuss, but we are we are quickly running out of time. But I do want to um, ask you, um, you write in the book, quote, we don't want to worship our favorite athletes. We want to be inspired by them. Marble figures can't do that, but human beings can. You've worked with so many top athletes. Do you have a favorite? Well, yeah, I I talk about Kobe just, Bryant. Yeah, Kobe Bryant and his what I learned from them. We talked about curiosity a lot, right? And to be able to be in the room and see his boundless imagination and curiosity, and not only the fact that he was always learning and trying to find new points of inspiration in the world outside of basketball, like off the court but that he was so generous in terms of sharing that with us. Because at the end of the day, your creative idea is only as strong as where you, the end result is only gonna be as strong as where you start. And to be able to work with someone who was so great at articulating kind of how he felt about his style of play and what kind of metaphors and points of inspiration would represent that or what he saw in the world of technology or entertainment or art. And, and so that's a quite powerful um, when you are able to share passion and curiosity together to get to these amazing innovations and results. And so um, he, he obviously was someone that um, I, I not only uh, learned a lot from, um, but um, just I just obviously um, miss greatly in terms of what he meant, um, not only to basketball, but back to that idea of the daydreamers and the introverts and the diverse ones, you know, um, he blew a lot of wind into our sails, right. And made us better, um, as not only, uh, professionals, but as people. Mm -hmm. 
did you ever play hoops with any of these athletes or football or, you know, have a go at tennis? Thankfully, uh, in well, in my head I did, okay? <laughs> um, as a daydreamer, uh, obviously... <laughs> Um, you know, I'm sure I, th I at times thought, um, you know, I would be right at home uh, side by side with them. But thankfully, um, you know, they're, they're, they were, um, you know, not they didn't have to entertain our delusions and aspirations um, as people who wanted to compete at that level. So um, but you can always dream. Right. And that's what I'm asking people to do is make sure you allow daydreaming. Uh, within the workday and protect that time. <laughs> Great way to end. Thank you so much to Greg Hoffman for a fascinating discussion. Your focus on storytelling and emotion in marketing actually reminds me of a Maya Angelou quote. She said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people never forget how you made them feel. So please pick up his new book, Emotion by Design. Let me just pick that up again. Um, Creative Leadership Lessons from a Life at Nike. It's a great read and some wonderful lessons there about business and, um, and life. Thank you so much, Greg. And thank you all for joining us. I'm Linda Yu, and you've been listening to Intelligence Squared.